What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 262 at block height 676,732 on Sunday, March 28th. And today, many master balls wasted. We have Janine back with us again. We... We've captured her for you, party people. All for you. So I feel like this is just one of those days where there's a million things swirling in my head I want to banter about before we really get into things, but I I can't pull a single concrete thing out of the swirl. So should we flush it? Um, If it gets the stupid SNL skit about NFTs out of my head, yes, yes, push, push the flush button. You I know... Don't. Well, so I did not plan to be gone for the last month, but I should say that maybe this was the perfect month to be gone because um, I have not seen any of this NFT stuff, basically. I am very confused by what everyone is talking about, and I have missed a bunch of inside jokes now. I don't know if it was Paris Hilton showing up in a clubhouse room trying to sell whatever she wanted to sell as an NFT that tripped me off to the public awareness of this but certainly snl skits uh are right up there nfts are definitely the icos of this cycle money what, laundering what I... money laundering everywhere yeah the the one that i did see was john cleese doing an nft but he mistakenly instead of saying non-fungible token he said non non-tradable token or what what did he say Non-refundable. Non-refundable. Yes. And non that <laughs> that was I refuse like to believe. I refuse, no matter what proof you could possibly put in front of me, that that was an accident. That was on purpose. I hope so, because it was pretty funny. And like, oh my god, what the hell else did he say? Um, ah, oh, fuck. What? Um, cryptic currencies. Non-refundable tokens and cryptic currencies. If you guys haven't seen it, give yourself a couple minutes. Go find it. John Cleese selling the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah, it was a. As I told Shinobi when I saw it, it was a very uh, "hello, fellow kids" moment. Well, you see, when when someone has a bridge to sell, you see, you buy that bridge and then you trust them. That's what they're for. Yep. NFTs, a bridge to nowhere. Yep. I still <laughs> say the only valid NFT is for that Banksy that they burn. Yeah. Burn more Banksies. I'll only give you that one just because the specific Banksy was so perfect, but it, it's still like you're 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 ruining real art for a stupid fucking token. That's a one hundred thousand dollar sense of humor right there. Yeah. At least it's better than ICOs, arguably. Alrighty. Yeah, at least at least we have something to look at instead of people's tears when they lose them. <laughs> Alright though. Guess we should dive into things. So Janine did anything actually happen at this taproot meeting um well unfortunately uh given my schedule i wasn't able to attend most of them so i don't know how it compares to the others but uh basically since i've been gone there has been recurring taproot activation meetings i don't know if you've covered all of them but at this one which was on march 23rd uh as you may remember at the beginning of the month 
Uh, Rusty Russell proposed a so-called speedy trial method whereby activation of taproot Schnorra is attempted and allowed to either quickly succeed or quickly fail without compromising safety in either case, according to the text. And as summarized by Jeremy Rubin, uh, this speedy trial method was discussed during this taproot meeting, um, and there were no objections to it in general regarding the parameter selection. There was some consensus around having a target in May for the start height and then activation time around November 15th or block height 707616, uh, which I feel like that was maybe a number chosen for reasons. But uh, Jeremy notes that there's concurrence that regarding... uh, There's concurrence that regardless of pushing the start or stop dates, we should hold the November 15th date steady as slipping past Thanksgiving turns to Christmas, turns to New Year's, turns to Chinese New Year, and we're looking at March as the next date people would want to schedule. There's concurrence that as long as we're getting to a release sometime in May with a strong preference for mid-May as opposed to end of May that we don't need to reevaluate. Uh, yeah, so it sounds like stuff is going to start happening in May, and then we want to have activation happening sometime in November, which, again, that is uh, still within the kind of one-year date that we were talking about at the beginning of the year that people were talking uh, or proposing that it would be. Um, And then, of course, Luke was still advocating for a UASF, uh, which there wasn't really disagreement about, but he was saying that the client for a US, UASF should be available as soon as possible, ideally before the other client. And then Michael Folkson, uh, this wasn't in the meeting, but after the meeting uh, in the mailing list, he responded to say that he would want to either use a date time, for example, November 15th, UTC, whatever that is, or to use a block height for the activation mechanism, but he does not think it would be a good idea to do a mix of both. Some developers need their face slapped off. Oh, did I miss something? (laughs) No, it's just, just, just this dragging on and on and on because of ego, because of pointless bike shedding because of pointless concern trolling everybody wants to turn this on turn it the fuck on pick something like holy fucking shit pick something and like the 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 entire debate is just circling around setting a precedent for doing it like i'm sorry there is no precedent setting there is no guaranteed forks here like whatever gets done here has zero guarantee that in two or three years when we try to fork a new thing in that it'll work that the landscape will be the same like it's completely fallacious idiotic thinking that's just wasting time like just turn it on like this is getting so stupid at this point yeah i mean i understand if they want to push it back because they think that more review is needed and they're not confident but at this point it doesn't sound like that's the reason and i would also understand if they wanted to do this because there was actual contention somewhere but there doesn't really seem to be contention so i don't know why we want to set a precedent that when literally everything is going fine and people agree with each other we still have to delay everything because we're afraid of disagreeing with each other yeah, are they trying to be like the U.S. government or something? Everybody agrees we should have term limits on these people. We agree on a lot of other things, but do they do it? No. Yeah, and the U.S. government also does the opposite, where every like there's huge debate and contention about something, and they just want to fast track it through to get rid of the debate. <laughs> Quit trying to be like government. Yeah, and I mean the the whole thing is just fallacious thinking. Like this system will ossify one day it will be too big to be changed just period and at that point the only things that will ever change about it are critical things that have to change or the whole system breaks like we're we're not getting feature upgrades we're not getting new functions after a point that's just the consequence of this system if it actually works properly and like seeing all these developers talk about precedence and like the night, it's like just people want the thing, turn the thing on. Like trying to set precedence for this is utterly useless because if those precedents 
work out and you can just push things through whatever set way, then this system is a failure. If it does not eventually ossify and refuse to change except for critical failures or problems, then it is a failed system. So like this whole debate and the reason behind it, it's just a giant fallacy. And it blows my mind how many developers in this space don't get that. Also, um, does anyone know what's special about November 15th? Like, I feel like if they have a specific date like that, they should have a reason. Is it some kind of like a holiday or like, why, why not November 5th? Like, I'm, I'm always annoyed when people <laughs> forget about November 5th. I have no idea. I, I don't know. You have it on November 15th. Why not just put it on Bitcoin's birthday or something like to at least have it be a special day or I don't know. Like, no one's going to really remember the day that Taproot got activated. I'm sorry. <laughs> Except for us. Some devs need their faces slapped off. No, no there's no need for violence. <laughs> that, that may become a contentious issue, shouldn't we? Don't care. Okay, well, the next Taproot meeting is going to discuss which devs need their faces slapped, apparently. Yep. Sounds like a worthwhile meeting. Let's get the lightning boys what they need to continue advancing science over there and move on. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, though. Are we ready for some updates from the giant douchebags known as the FATF? You mean the big fat F? Yep. Of course. This is one of the things that I actually read while I was gone. <laughs> yeah, so... This is just an update to the last outstanding draft of their recommendations. Um, I'm going to just go mostly through the significant changes that stood out to me. But, you know, just a refresher, um, to be considered a virtual asset service provider in exchange or such, um, you must either facilitate the exchange of different assets um, or asset to fiat the transfer of assets between different users, the safekeeping, administration, control, or issuance of an asset. Now, some of the big things here um, are just really subtle changes that have very big potential consequences. Um, for instance, in the prior draft, um, for all the travel rule implementation and compliance shenanigans, there was a somewhere around a page and a half of the draft that specifically kept reiterating that VASPs interacting with individuals who are not VASPs are not part of the compliance requirements, are not part of the major risk profile as long as you've ID'd the customer, et cetera, et cetera. And just clarifying, these regulations have nothing to do with these things. Well, um, they have now shifted to the point of specifically pointing out peer-to-peer um, -peer transactions as a heightened um, money laundering or terrorist financing um, risk and have jumped to the point of specifically... Um, stating that these types of transactions between a VASP and a peer-to-peer -peer individual should be looked at as by default a heightened risk for money laundering or terrorist financing and explicitly um, recommended things like blockchain analytics so that VASPs can further scrutinize to a higher degree these types of transactions because of a default increase in risk here. Um, yeah, um, <clears throat> banks don't launder fuck tons of money all the time. Yeah, I, I just want to say I actually agree with this. I do want to be able to figure out whether I'm sending money to any douchebag businesses that do this. So I do want to know if, you know, as a peer-to-peer -peer user, if I'm sending money to a VASP, uh, I want to maybe stop that because I do not want to finance uh, the terrorizing of the monetary system with these businesses. <laughs> mm hmm And, um, yeah, they as well go a step further and recommend um, potentially just refusing to engage 
period, with transactions to non-VASP entities. So if you're in a high-risk environment, just don't allow users to withdraw. Um, also recommending um, potentially for the, uh, the jurisdiction or the government um, to deny licensing to a VASP if they participate in transactions to non-VASP entities. Um, so yeah, this has just completely shifted um, from if you're using your own keys and wallet, nothing to do with you, don't worry, to like, oh, that type of thing is now a massive money laundering risk. So that's really, really fun. Really quick about turn. Um, totally unexpected. But yeah, um, this is where things are starting to creep. And um, yeah, they've also gone and inserted um, multiple mentions of multi-sig um because see the big characteristics remember of being a VASP are exchanging transferring safekeeping administering controlling or issuing a virtual asset well they they're now um tweaking language to say that um using a multi-signature setup even a multi-signature setup where you who is possibly a VASP does not have keys to unilaterally move that themselves. They require keys that a user holds to actually move or do anything with those funds. Um, this does not exempt you from being considered a VASP. Wow. So CASA, Unchained Capital, any of these types of multi-sig escrow services, very interesting consequences for that. Um, and as well, potentially the same thing for the Lightning Network. Um, and th this is kind of going in an interesting direction in my mind because it's, it's kind of contradictory in the sense of their defining control but attempting to rework all of the language mentioning multi-sig to include that as control, even if a multi-sig participant does not have enough keys to unilaterally do something. Or in the case of the Lightning Network, where even without enough keys to unilaterally do something, they still have the transactions required to push things to chain and transact anyway. So the, the entire application of the word control, at least from my reading of this, has just become wildly contradictory and ambiguous. Um, so that's really fucked up. Um, that could potentially domino into a lot of very bad directions um, if this is actually approved, finalized, and countries start adopting that type of interpretation of control as it relates to things using multi-sig. And then um, the, the last kind of what thing um, is they specifically mention lawyers performing escrow services in their service as lawyers um, being considered VASPs if they are directly doing that themselves instead what? of using a, a third service for that so yeah that is just like what the holy fuck and really the the there are only two positive things here um from what i've seen in this draft change um they still maintain that critical protocol infrastructures such as miners even though they do process transactions are not considered VASPs. So they haven't decided to, to reword that one yet and start trying to layer this stuff on top of miners. Um, Why? Because they, they want to give it a bit so that we, we just stop paying attention probably. And no, seriously, the <laughs> imagine, imagine saying multi-sig is kind of like a VASP, but miners aren't, like seriously. <laughs> not good doesn't make any sense which is exactly why i am fully confident the next thing they're going to tweak is that um and then the the last positive thing is they still um require 
um, performing an activity regularly and for commercial purposes as a business um, in order to be considered a VASP. So my read is at least until they tweak that too in the future, um, you can still do things like hold your mom and dad's Bitcoin because they don't even know how to program a VCR or maybe let a friend hook up to your lightning node. But the minute you start doing that as a business, um, you could be considered a VASP. And especially in the case of things like um, nodes routing on lightning, that could get into a really sticky situation because, you know, as far as whether you are or are not a business, um, if you are making money, um, government will kind of just arbitrarily decide you're a business when they want to decide you're a business. And that's just how that goes. So, um, yeah, all around, um, the FATF has done exactly what most of us thought they would do. Um, and just started gunning for any type of peer-to-peer -peer use of things and ratcheting up the the circle around that. Big surprise, right? I agree. So, They're a report with an F. To me, this smells like prepping the ground for banks to come in and making this their area, their domain to play within. They uh, they don't like competition. So if they can get the regulator to get their competition out of the market before they show up, all the better. Whether it's lawyers, uh, whether it's any other kind of service providers, whether it's giving them cover for white label Bitcoin and just trading that as quote unquote Bitcoin amongst themselves. I think this is an effort to regulatorily carve out territory that they can own. Yep. And this kind of shit is exactly why I am getting so pissed about this nonsense with Taproot. Turn it the fuck on. We still need any prev output or things like lightning are not going to scale in a lean enough way that people can just do that anyway. E e even if this type of regulation slaps down on things, because that, that is the hard reality. If you did not expect Bitcoin banks to come to this space, you were not using your head. And in order for that not to dominate this space, the alternatives, things like Lightning, like state chains, even Liquid, they need to scale. They need to be able to operate in an environment where regulations and laws are hostile to those things because they are the decentralized competition to banks. So knock the shit off turn the thing on ready to turn on now and let's get working on the next thing that is absolutely necessary for there to be decentralized competing alternatives to the Bitcoin banks that are about to start showing up in waves. I'm with that. Let's empower ourselves here before the banks show up. Speaking of banks. Oh yeah. The banks got together to talk Bitcoin the other day. The uh, BIS hosted what they called an innovation summit at which they held things like uh, competitions, hackathons uh, to work with SWIFT and whatever ISO related standards there are to SWIFT, which is pretty great. Uh, I listened to the opening salvo uh, that had Austin Carsons from the BIS, I believe he's the president or the runner of the BIS, uh, had Jerome Powell from the United States Federal Reserve, had an underling from the ECB, and I'm trying to remember who's moderating, moderating, maybe a lady from the New York Times. Uh, sadly, I could not find a transcript of this, but it's out there on YouTube for anybody that wants to watch it. The take home I've got from that, I didn't make extensive notes because I was hoping they would post a transcript, was Carson's standing up and saying, you know what, we are ready to go. We've been studying this thing. I believe there's a quote in there of him saying he thinks they could have a CBDC ready in two or three years. And what was fun was he stepped up and said that, and, and then Jerome Powell talked him back from that, and the ECB um, 
gentleman talked him back from that. I think they are still very interested in the commercial banks feeling at ease with this thing before they would drop something on them. And we haven't even had the political conversations yet around what a CBDC should look like that isn't Chinese and doesn't completely survey you and isn't just PayPal money, essentially. Uh, one of the other take homes was how many times they said Bitcoin in there. They are definitely looking at Bitcoin as a potential digital currency challenger and conflating various properties of Bitcoin versus centralized bank money uh, and the perceived uh, advantages perhaps that Bitcoin has versus central bank money uh, while not talking about how it's non-state currency that you can't fuck with. Um, so I, I think it was an interesting exercise in branding, but the take home to me was, I don't think the largest central banks are as concerned about CBDCs as the BIS is interested in shipping CBDCs, at least at this point. Because they have no clue what the fuck they even are. They just know buzzwords and this Bitcoin thing is looking real scary these days. That is what it smells like. And central banks uh, in given countries actually have to deal with their member banks who typically own them and vote within their systems so i think the bis might be in this uh you know pontif pontification spot you know up in the mountain on the hill kind of shouting down to everybody at, at what they'd love to see happen but everybody else has realities of actually managing these systems. I just, I don't get the feeling they're quite as on board yet. There's no I in BS, just BS. 100% <laughs> BS. Let's see, that relates to a David Chom paper to come out of the Swiss National Bank. So Janine's going to put me and FUD to shame now. I don't know if I am because I have to read it more thoroughly, but um, yeah, so the Swiss National Bank sponsored a working paper authored by David Chaum, Christian Grothoff, and Thomas Moser on how to issue a central bank digital currency. Um, and uh, I just would like to note, uh, given the uh, current uh, controversy, it is interesting that one of the people listed uh, as providing comments or suggestions on the paper is Richard Stallman. Um, because a portion of the paper does center around uh, basically them advocating that any CBDC should be uh, should be created using uh, free free open source software, free as in freedom, not just free as in free beer. But um, yes, uh, interesting. And the abstract states, we do not address the normative question of whether a central bank should issue a central bank digital currency or not. Instead, we contribute to the current research debate by showing how a central bank could do so if desired. We propose a token-based system without distributed ledger technology and show how earlier deployed software-only electronic cash can be improved upon to preserve transaction privacy, meet regulatory requirements in a compelling way, and offer a level of quantum-resistant protection against systemic privacy risk. Neither monetary policy nor financial stability would be materially affected because a CBDC with this design would replicate physical cash rather than bank deposits. And now, so I haven't read the whole paper, as I said, but there are a few in interesting points. Um, first of all, they have a paragraph stating that DLT is an interesting design if no central party is available uh, or if the interacting entities are not willing to agree on a trusted central party. Uh, however, this is hardly the case for a retail CBDC issued by a central bank. Distributing the central bank's ledger with a blockchain merely increases transaction costs. It does not provide tangible benefits in a central bank deployment. Utilizing DLT to issue digital cash may be useful if there is no central bank to start with, uh, ergo the Marshall Islands Sovereign Project, or if the explicit intention is to do without a central bank, ergo Bitcoin. So yes, they state uh, the very obvious thing that most people should understand, which is that if you're trying to do any centralized thing, uh, using a blockchain or distributed ledger makes no sense. It's just a buzzword, so you should stop. Um, so I'm glad they got that in early, <laughs> saying that there there's no point in using a DLT if you're doing a central bank digital currency where the central bank basically controls it, because what is the point? The point of a blockchain is for a distributed system. So yeah, nothing interesting uh, about 
that, ju- well, just stating the obvious, kind of, and uh, maybe that's necessary for their audience, uh, but uh, I will scroll further. So they also claim uh, this, because I was kind of focusing on the privacy aspects, um, because uh, I should point out, um, this is based on Taller, which is T-A-L-E-R, which is something that I looked at many years ago, and I was not very impressed i mean it wasn't it was kind of i mean it was fine like i'll say it was fine like it did kind of add some privacy for people who are you know the idea of money that you're basically only using it to kind of buy things and you want some privacy from merchants and maybe from banks but if you are a merchant yourself uh didn't do much for you and uh, I just kind of didn't like the marketing of Taller that it was like a competitor to Bitcoin because it absolutely wasn't, um, not even close. But yeah, so this is kind of inspired by Taller. I don't know if any of the people working on the paper, I think David Chaum is actually working on that project. Um, but yeah, uh, if it's based on that, I'm not confident in it being a competitor to Bitcoin, so it doesn't surprise me that now it's uh, kind of they're putting it in the running for some kind of CBDC design instead, because that makes more sense. Uh, If anyone remembers the original eCash paper, I believe that the focus in it uh, was uh, specifically privacy while also preventing money laundering, and one of the reasons that Nick Zabo, who I think worked at eCash early on uh, in his career, one of the reasons he said that he left eCash or he wasn't interested in it, in it later on is that it was too centralized. And then he started writing about stuff that, you know, ended up being used as uh, the kind of foundational literature for Bitcoin uh, later on. And so, yeah, they claim that their CBDC design is is based on blind signatures and a two-tier architecture, guarantees perfect quantum-resistant transaction privacy while providing anti-money laundering and counterterrorism financing protections uh, for society that are actually stronger than those of banknotes. Um, yeah, so uh, whenever those kinds of claims are made, I get really nervous, and I haven't read the paper thoroughly enough to see how they uh, how they argue that. But uh, the the two there's a couple of paragraphs that kind of lay out at least how it works from their perspective. Um, uh, and for there's also a very long paragraph about transaction privacy being important. So I do like that they emphasize that privacy is important. That's always good to see. But whether they will actually execute it is another. Um, So it says, first, it protects users from government scrutiny and surveillance abuses. Mass surveillance programs are problematic even if people believe they have nothing to hide simply because of the potential for error and abuse, particularly if such programs lack transparency and accountability. Second, transaction privacy protects users from data exploitation by payment service providers. Third, it protects users from the other party in a transaction, ruling out the possibility of ex post opportunistic behavior or security risks due to the failure or neglect of customer data protection. Uh, and they claim that they claim that they're able to do this by creating, quote, a genuine digital bearer instrument because when the user withdraws a sum of money in the form of a number, the number is blinded or hidden by the smartphone in a special encryption. Now, the thing that made me really nervous when I was trying to read more about what do they mean by on the smartphone with special encryption is that they mentioned tying it to a SIM card. And they did immediately explain why that was probably not a great idea, mostly because of, um, well, SIM cards are uh, (laughs) not great. uh, They're not great identifiers, um, as everyone should well know by now. Um, I mean, they're great identifiers if you don't know what you're doing and you're trying to track people, but they're terrible identifiers for actually controlling your identity in any way, um, if you actually care about that. So they continue, in the actual system, a coin is a public-private key pair with the private key only known to the owner of the coin. The coin derives its financial value from the central bank's signature on the coin. Uh, I find that sentence kind of funny. The coin derives its financial value from the central bank's signature on the coin's public uh, key. Um, Yeah, I don't, that's not really how value works, but okay. I think what they mean is authenticity, not financial value, because I'm, I, I don't, Yeah, anyway, the central bank makes the signature with its private key and has multiple denomination key pairs available for blind signing coins of different values. A merchant can use the central bank's corresponding public key to verify the signature. So basically, you just have the central bank... 
it's like basically how banknotes have this, you know, signature technically on it. But, um, you know, I mean, no one is actually signing the dollar bills by hand. Um, and, but in this case, they apparently expect the central bank to sign every coin uh, in some way to then give it authenticity, which, okay, I don't know if that's technically uh, efficient, but... Uh, and that, yeah, a merchant can use the central bank's corresponding public key to verify the signature. However, to be sure that the coin has not been copied and already redeemed by another payee, ergo has not been double spent, the merchant must deposit the coin so that the central bank can check the coin against a file of redeemed coins, because neither the central or neither the commercial bank nor the central bank see the coin's number during withdrawal. Later, when the merchant deposits the coin, it is unknown which user withdrew it. The blinding and the resulting privacy are what make this type of CBDC a true digital bearer instrument. So, thoughts? So, they pretty much limit things so that the like a note can only be spent once and like it has to go back into an account. Um that was that was kind of my understanding when I read about Taller. I have not read this paper enough to see how, like how controlled it is in terms of how many times you can spend it between, you know, the person who withdraws it, like the payee and and the eventual merchant, but it sounds like at some point you have to give it to a merchant for it to enter back into the system, which seems a Kind of, I don't know, that seems very limiting to me. Like, it, it kind of, it, again, I think it was also the impression I got when reading with Toller is that the the money is only considered legitimate or part of the system or usable via merchants, but obviously there are other uses of money that merchants aren't involved in merchants are only one actor in the system and i think it just felt very merchant focused to me they talk about it as if it can be a bearer asset but then they bring up that point which is you have to turn it into the central bank to even validate that it's not a double spend on you and if that's the case then i don't quite under understand it as a bearer asset or the circuitry required there because that would make me assume that every single time a merchant or anybody gets paid they would want to turn it in to make sure they weren't just double spent against so i I, yeah it kind of makes that a short circuity system it's not quite a 20 dollars bill that passes from person to person to person many times before it can go back to the bank i mean this sounds kind of like like Xiaomi and eCash light and like th- this is even something i've kind of like brought up just the general idea of a lot looking at like businesses like cash app and like better ways you could do centralized bitcoin transactions and like i think th- their thinking is probably similar to mine in that if you can like have everybody can have an account where it's like a denominated account everybody knows like the bank knows whose account is whose, but you can withdraw blinded notes from that that have to be spent directly into an account and nothing else, then like you you can still get like that consumer protection privacy. Like when I go buy a, a fucking dildo or something, like nobody knows that's me. Like it's blinded when I pulled it out, goes in, like the merchant, the bank doesn't know where it came from, but nobody knows I bought a dildo. But it's like, you know what I mean? You you provide that purchasing privacy, but because it's limited and can only be spent into an account, that does actually deal with like massive um, structural money laundering like concerns and shit. Because, you know, large flows, they will stand out and you can just, you know, figure that out with timing analysis and shit. Yeah, it's definitely interesting that a merchant can validate by using public keys that the central bank shares with everybody to validate the signatures on these notes. But considering that you don't have a way to guarantee that it's not spent yet, I kind of question how this is really a cash substitute. Unless unless the uh, central bank is going to make the list of spent coins public somehow and anyone can verify that and not just merchants 
Well, and I'm not sure if you need their private key to unblind the coin to actually check whether it's been spent. No, that that should be done user side. Um, you would like get it blinded and then unblind, and just pass that off whenever you want to spend it. I was, it wasn't left clear to me that there was a way to do that without turning the coin back into the central bank. No, um, any anything like that with a Chaumian system would just require blind trust. I mean, this. I I I don't know. I'd say it's more pseudo cash than cash, even in like a perfect bearer system where you can just pass the note along and don't have to put it into a denominated account. Well, and then I I don't. So I guess what these num because the the impression I get from the paper is that they see these numbers as being in a smartphone app. They they mention there being a smartphone app, but the point of cash is that you. It's paper. You don't need uh, you don't need something like a smartphone because there's also like I don't know. There's privacy issues just with having a smartphone. So the fact that they haven't I don't as far as I read I don't know if they considered that enough. Um, probably not. But so I mean, if anyone wants to make it much more like cash, what these numbers would be printed out on paper, and then you have to make sure that the paper is destroyed once the coin is spent because then the 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 coin or number that's on the paper is no longer valid so you basically have to destroy the paper right well it would be a race condition so you could give that to three different merchants at a time and effectively double spin them and whoever turns the coin into the central bank first is the paid merchant yeah, like what what prevents you from making multiple copies of the number and then trying to double spend those? I think only the controls on the central bank produce piece of software on your smartphone that holds the numbers. Yeah, I mean, there is no way theoretically I'm aware of to do like chow me and cash stuff without having to connect to the back end. Um, unless you just want to like blindly trust people that they're not going to double spend you. Yeah, because I mean, this is why this is why we have the you know we don't accept zero conf anymore because this I mean you can also attempt to do this with Bitcoin. The difference is that if you expect at least one confirmation, you know where the coins went after one confirmation. So this is basically like this is like a zero conf CBDC <laughs> system where it's like you, like the only confirmation you can get is from the central bank and whoever. You don't really know if you have that until you turn it in. Unless yeah. they make their list public, which I didn't check if they do that or not. Well, I would assume that that should be a given, but I have no idea. Even if they did, like that would be such a massive indexing problem for yeah. people to be able to verify that. Like, they'd just... have to. They'd have to do an initial uh, initial uh, coin list download or something, right? <laughs> Well, they'd have to have some that, kind of blockchain. <laughs> how does that even protect a person? Because, like, let's say I'm surveilling you, and I give you a hundred dollar coin, and then I notice that you just check to see if it's valid, and then I give somebody else, or maybe an anonymous account that might be myself, that hundred dollar coin, and I actually go spend it and check it back into the central bank, maybe before you can. There's race conditions here. Oh yeah, the central bank would be able to arbitrarily like y you would have to make that interaction atomic um cryptographically or the bank could just screw anyone they want. Yeah. yeah I, it, go ahead. I yeah, I just don't I don't really get how they can claim that it's a true digital bearer instrument if I mean, maybe they do go into this in more detail and I just missed it, but like uh, the whole point of a bearer instrument is that it's kind of self-evident of its on like its authenticity and its value, at least in you know being what it says it is. Is is you're able to ascertain that easily. You don't have to necessarily go to a centralized provider to do that. So I don't know how they can claim that. Well, I mean, like th this is a big part of why a lot of the newer Chaumian systems use the public key, private key pair and have the bank sign the public key um, instead of just like literally a number that you physically pass over. Um, 
because like the whole point of that is if it's just a number, the second the bank gets it, they can just screw you and do whatever they want. But when you have to sign um, with the matching private key and then present the public key, the bank signature and that public keys, private key, like there's that extra authorization layer and the potential to like do um, like adapter signature, like atomic signature type stuff um, with other updates. But like with, without that addition of like using a key pair instead of just a long number, like there's like zero way to prove like the bank just stole your money because you can't challenge them to provide the signature from your key. Also, I don't know, what if you, I don't know, you go and spend some of the coins at a business and then you just happen, like it just ha so happens that the central bank decides they're no longer going to accept, like for some reason they're not going to accept information or, or coins from that business. What happens to your coins that you gave to the merchant? Well, you have the opportunity to run next door and spend it somewhere else real quick. <laughs> Keep on working, boys. I mean, that, yeah, that's just a, yeah, it doesn't, I'll have to read it more, and it's good that it, again, that it cares about privacy. I don't know if it's going to effectively do that. I mean, for a CBDC, like, again, I'm kind of skeptical of anyone who thinks that they can make a CBDC that's privacy respecting, because I think we all know that that is, like, privacy is not one of the goals of these things. Like, they, they want more control. They don't want to give us control in that way yeah austin carsons has been very explicit about that and that is one thing that i appreciate about this paper is they routinely emphasize um perhaps the rights of the consumer using money uh there's there's a lot of good quotes in there especially around how this needs to be uh free and open source software that's running in the background that everybody has access to reading to legitimize the actual system and potentially refine the actual system. Uh, another thing that they note in there is how a CDC technology potentially puts central banks in competition with commercial banks. Uh, one good quote was, by providing bank accounts to the public, a central bank would also be in direct competition with commercial banks. This competition would entail two risks. First, it could threaten the deposit base of banks and, in the extreme, disintermediate the banking sector. Second, allowing people to shift their deposits into a central bank safe haven could speed up bank runs during financial crises. So they're definitely cognizant of how this cuts out commercial banks, which is where many of us hold most of our money. Yep. That's the thing I've been waiting for them to, to have click in their head for years. Actually, um, I can say uh, truthfully that that is not the case for me at all. But <laughs> Well, it's just like when they throw an idea out there and you look at the idea and it's like this idea would destabilize the entire private financial sector. And then you look at the people who are supposed to be in charge of that and they don't get it. It's just like... Uh-huh. Well, I'm going to set my stopwatch here. This ties directly into the Fed and ECB heads walking Austin Carson's back in that, that previous story. Uh, they understand how this is attacking their constituents, which are those commercial banks. So there's an interesting dance going on here of signaling that we're going to be New, different, better by talking about CBDCs, especially as related to this crazy thing called Bitcoin and making sure that your actual customers and stakeholders are happy with whatever you do with digital money, which is already most money. Mm -hmm. All right, though, I think I think I got to got to interject the mini final thoughts on this topic and we should mosey on, though. I think we've been going for like 20, 25 minutes on this one. Mm hmm. Any last comments, thoughts? All right. I will take the silence as a no. Fudge, you're up. Yeah. So, next topic uh, Fidelity this past week filed for a Bitcoin ETF offering. 
Uh, they are calling it the Wise Origin Bitcoin Trust. I think they are about the seventh company here in the United States to file for such a thing. Uh, others include Wisdom Tree, VanEck, Nidig, Skybridge, First Trust, and Bitwise, um, most of which already run other ETF products. And there are now three Bitcoin ETFs live in Canada, and I read that one is also live in Brazil. So the U.S. is behind in Bitcoin ETFs. Uh, we're going to have to see how they rectify that with regards to um, how many they approve whenever they finally approve them or whether they even approve any, which, you know, they've been really good at not approving any ETFs. But with GBDC running below the Bitcoin price now for some number of weeks, uh, one might suspect due to these Canadian Bitcoin ETFs being in existence, I have to wonder how long the SEC will decide that the U.S. financial system should be behind Canada's. So what you're saying is <clears throat> Fidelity applied for an ETF, and we're going to get an ETF now because it's Fidelity. Almost has to. I don't know how you can keep Fidelity out of that game. But there are probably a number of other good ETFs in there. Vanek offers many ETFs, so does Wisdom Tree. So to say that these guys are not capable is probably not accurate. Well, I mean, it's just my thinking is like you're not going to say no to Fidelity. Um, they have been in this space deeply researching, studying, looking for years and finally started rolling out in the last few products and services. Um, yeah, they're putting weight and capital and time. Like they're not going to take no for an answer. And if you give fidelity a yes, then you can't really deny a yes to anybody else who has the same kind of risk management profiles and plans as fidelity. So. <laughs> yeah. And I don't remember all the states that these applications go through, uh, but eventually you tick on a clock where they have to refuse your ETF or they have to approve it over some period of time. And they have delays built in there. We've seen all that. I don't remember if it's around six months or eight months that you get as the maximal time on that clock. But it could well be later this year they are forced to act on one of these. Well, it's just I don't see Fidelity getting shot down. They're fucking Fidelity. And... If that happens, then I hope they start approving all of the others because like if if we get ETFs here, the last fucking thing I want is just one or two big ones and all of the coins flowing into their coffers. Like if we're going to have this type of institutional thing, there should be lots of them and they should be as distributed as possible. Yep, I agree with that. And just it would also be quite a kingmaker move if SEC only approved one of these out of the gate, assuming that multiple of them meet the standards that they're looking for over at SEC. You know, Van Eck has been trying to get one of these through for quite a long time, and they keep withdrawing it before uh, they get a formal no from SEC. Uh, so I don't know how they couldn't launch a couple of these simultaneously. Yep. And that will get very interesting in terms of boomer exposure. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's widely expected that whenever these things launch, they will see the biggest inflows in the first days of trading of any ETF that's ever been released. Speaking of boomer exposure, though. Yeah. We've got a story out of... Uh, lands down under. Uh, a New Zealand fund manager uh, has released a Kiwi Saber uh, fund, which evidently uh, there are a number of these funds that are government qualified to be held inside of your 401k equivalent in New Zealand. Uh, one such fund uh, has just released, uh, it's the Kiwi Saver Growth Fund. Uh, I am probably going to miss the name of the company that released this, uh, but the CIO of the fund is James Grigger, and he uh, gave an interview to uh, an NZ magazine about this, 
Uh, it sounds like they initially got into Bitcoin around 10,000 US dollars last October, and it makes up about 5% of their $244 million fund. Uh, so not a giant fund, but one that can live inside of New Zealanders tax advantage savings accounts, which is really what makes it notable. And reading the article, uh, they interview, I don't know, two or three other fund managers who are happy to talk shit about how speculative this asset is, et cetera, et cetera, and how it doesn't belong in their funds yet. Uh, but Mr. Grigger stepped out on a limb and is evidently offering this inside of tax sheltered accounts for New Zealanders. So congrats. That is going to get really interesting in a few years when other retirement funds and products start looking at how this and any other front movers who, who do the same thing perform and like yeah when yeah. When, when you start getting all the boomers with insolvent you know funds payments that aren't going to keep showing up forever um looking at bitcoin <laughs> let's yeah. just say that's when bitcoin tina ranting about up forever and michael saylor might actually be right for a little while Yep, you have huge first mover advantage in this because all of your customers will see the gains while everybody else is still figuring it out. So this may well attract a lot more money. So it'll be interesting to see next time we end up talking about this for whatever reason, how big that fund has grown to. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin for boomers. Uh, speaking of other people getting funding in, in the Bitcoin banking space. Yeah. So Avanti Bank in Wyoming uh, just closed a Series A financing round um, and raised $37 million, um, bringing their total up to 44 And pretty much their plans here are to invest uh, this money in engineering costs, but also um, a lot of it was raised just to meet the capital requirements um, for the license they're operating under. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, Bitcoin banks, um, this one's been in the motions for a while and has a patent pending, um, us dollar token, um, the Avid that they're planning to launch. So yeah, that that's coming and more will copy that. But I just noticed a re real little tiny, interesting thing in this beyond just Avanti's still chugging along and building things. Um, who is who is who is one of the investors in this series A? Trace Mayer. Trace the fucking Mayer, dude. Yeah. Trace Mayer. He didn't disappear. He he just shut up online after he completely torched his reputation. Hmm. He's been a big fan of Wyoming's uh, laws and has been involved, I believe, uh, on the consultation side. Uh, I'm going to forget the names of the others involved besides Caitlin Long. Uh, but he's been up there talking lawyer stuff about how this stuff should work and at one point was a vocal proponent for these guys. So definitely interesting when he shows up in there. Well, it's just, it's just like, you know what I mean? This is like the first little confirmation here that he didn't just disappear to ride his investments and not be involved in anything no he's he's still doing things he just shut the fuck up in public after he made a gigantic ass of himself yeah i think he's been an investor across a number of companies like this uh so he's still around guys well i mean it's just you know avanti is what it is um but yeah, it's just, I don't know, gives me a weird inkling feeling that he's that actively involved in it still, um, given the fact that he just blatantly showed he gives zero fucks about dumping pump and dump bullshit on people's head with his reputation. 
I'm happy to see the crypto native banking space uh, slowly taking off here. And Avanti is one of the forerunners in that, having gotten what I believe was the first Wyoming SPDI uh, license, which will give them access to the Federal Reserve and uh, being a full fledged bank. I want to smash the banks in the long term, but we're going to have to deal with them for a while. I want to smash them harder than you. I don't doubt it. Ha uh-huh. ha. Alrighty, though. Next up, I think the third and final phase of something in progress in Kentucky. Yeah, so in one of the last few episodes I was on before I disappeared for a month, we talked about Kentucky and other U.S. states planning to offer some incentives for miners of the digital coin kind to set up shop in their state. Um, And of course, the one most popular right now for doing something like this is Miami, which is why everyone is going to Florida right now. Not going to happen for me, guys. Um, Remote only. So... Uh, But the latest update from Kentucky is that their governor has now signed some bills as of March 25th to become effective on July 1st that could allow for, quote, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of tax breaks for technology firms and data center operators. Um, And the tax incentives for crypto miners fit into that broader process having been first introduced in January. This is from the block summarizing. Um... It was also coupled with an energy bill which supplements the state's existing framework for promoting clean energy use. And the bill uh, was sponsored by Representatives Stephen Rudy, Chris Freeland, and Patrick Flannery. And it states that it is necessary to clarify the General Assembly's original intention that Kentucky's tax code must and does recognize that the continuing development of new and advanced manufacturing and industrial processing technologies has led to new industrial processes such as blockchain used for commercial mining of cryptocurrency, which should and must be taxed in a manner similar to historical forms of manufacturing and industrial processing in order to continue to encourage the location and expansion of such operations in the Commonwealth rather than in other states likewise competing for such businesses. So yes, they're they're even acknowledging in the bill that there is uh, state uh, competition between states to uh, attract these businesses, and they also say in the bill, the tax imposed by KRS 139-200 or 139-310 shall not apply to the sale or purchase of electricity that is used or consumed in the commercial mining of cryptocurrency. Woohoo! So Kentucky's about to become a Bitcoin Wild West paradise. The Bitcoin mining wars have begun. That's really what America's second civil war is, just just mining wars. <laughs> get them in, get them settled, get them producing. This could be a lot of revenue for them in the uh, non-electrical tax area. Could also be a lot of political influence for one big giant tech company. That was an Intel reference. Good call, good call. So, my <laughs> boys over there at uh, good old Intel, you know, the guys that make the CPUs and pretty much, yeah. CPUs is the name of their game. They do other stuff as well. They'd like to do a lot more other stuff. So Intel announced uh, this past week that they want to get into the foundry game, uh, making chips for people who aren't Intel. Uh, So they're taking aim at companies such as TSMC, over in Taiwan uh, that evidently currently makes more than 50% of the world's ICs, uh, which is staggering. Uh, Anyway, Intel got a new CEO around a month ago uh, named Pat Gelsinger, and uh, he has decided that it's time for a strategic shift at the company to start making products for others. Uh, One might ask why? Uh, but we've seen companies like Apple and Microsoft now tend towards building their own CPUs instead of going with Intel. So I would have to wonder if that doesn't play into his plans here. Uh, 
Intel is said it has plans to spend roughly $20 billion between now and 2024 to build two chip facilities in Arizona. Construction will start immediately and production begin in 2024, according to the company. It will also set up an independent business unit dubbed Intel Foundry Services that will report directly to uh, Gelsinger as part of the new growth strategy. So this is definitely interesting. Um, I don't think companies pivot like this unless they see their bottom lines attacked. Uh, it's interesting to me, they're building in Arizona, which is also where I believe TSMC is currently building a chip fab. I don't know what sort of breaks they're getting out of Arizona or why Arizona is getting all this business. I think that would be interesting to know. Uh, one interesting quote out of the article on it was TSMC told Nike Asia that it will not comment on the plans of Intel, which it described as a longtime customer. <laughs> so Intel has certainly given lots of business to TSMC over the years, without a doubt. Um, the story also talked about how Intel shelved its seven nanometer process tech uh, until at least 2023, while Asian rivals, including TSMC and Samsung, are currently producing on cutting edge chip fabs. So uh, we're seeing onshoring of the integrated circuit slash CPU market, which is fantastic. We've heard nothing but delays and troubles getting orders and that sort of thing here lately so i think it's great that these big companies are going to outlay the billions involved to actually get this to get more fabs first of all but also onshore fabs so what you're saying is the pentagon decided to abandon taiwan so the nsa said intel you need to build us fabs Evidently, the date for abandoning Taiwan's security officially is sometime in 2024. I mean, it's just, I don't know. Yeah, on a serious note, th this just reads to me like even with the TSMC partnerships to start moving stuff and building stuff over here, like that is, that is not good enough for the U.S. government and they want our own companies doing that. I definitely want our own companies doing it. I don't know how I feel about that, honestly, because I don't really trust Intel. Somebody's got to make the chips. Yeah. Alrighty. Yeah, speaking of not-so-trustworthy giant entities getting into games where you would like to be able to trust them. You don't have to. Ha ha ha. So, um, three days ago, um... Microsoft's decentralized identity um, project Ion has launched mainnet on the Bitcoin network. Um, so, yep, up, running, open mainnet production. Um, they have dropped a uh, JavaScript library um, to handle um, generating and using uh, decentralized IDs, as well as a uh, SD key. <laughs> software development kit damn it um and as well also have a tool to anchor ids that you generate um into the uh kind of side blockchain that commits to bitcoin's blockchain using their node um so you don't have to run your own um as well as the node implementation you can run yourself and a explorer um, to scan the side tree chain um, and see or look for identities and whether or not they've actually been uh, committed to in the uh, blockchain commitments. And woohoo, out the door. Um, they already have a list of things that they want to start building out um, for future upgrades, including a light mode for the node. Um, so. I'm assuming a kind of pruned operation so that you can just keep up with things and only keep the specific identity data that you want to on your node. Um, they also want to build out support for ED25519 and BLS12-381, um, um, two different cryptographic curves um, and support those curves for key generation as well. Um, 
also want to implement um, kind of a better um, mempool control for getting things actually committed to in the blockchain, um, as well as create a kind of categorized um, type tagging for different types of decentralized IDs. So like an individual, uh, an IoT device, uh, software repo, and then build out the functionality to kind of query um, IDs registered on the, the side tree chain um, based on category instead of just kind of a naive blockchain scan. So really awesome to see this finally launch. Um, and especially like they're already thinking about what improvements are we going to push out next. But uh, yeah, the I think the utility of having an authentication credential to log into services, interact with people, et cetera, that is not in the control of a centralized company, like the, the value of that is so stupid. Yep. This is one thing that blockchains are theoretically good for. This drop looks really nice from a developer point of view. Uh, already having multiple JavaScript libraries so it can get integrated into web applications. Uh, having Docker images so you can spin your own instances of many of these things. Having a roadmap uh like they have for going forward it also looks like they consulted with a number of companies in this space whose names you would know uh which is great this has potential to actually be some form of authoritative identity on the internet that doesn't count on google or facebook not fucking you are we ready for the autism let's go full artist so I hope everybody, um, given all the arguing over Taproot right now and that stupidity, remembers the proposal for Taproot's cousin, Graftroot. So the whole idea behind Taproot is that before you send money to an address, you can tweak it so that it's not only spendable by just the private key that matches to it, but all the fancy time lock conditions or multi-sig or recovery or whatever you want to do. The limitation to that, though, is um, you have to define and decide all of that stuff before you actually send coins and lock them to that script and address. The whole idea behind graft root was why do you have to do that beforehand? Um, why can't I just take the key that that coin is actually locked with and just make a whole new script and sign that script with that key and give you the new script and the signature? And so instead of having to define all the fancy stuff I want to do ahead of time, I can just make it whenever I want, sign it and give it to you. And as long as you still have the signature on that new script from the main key, then, hey, you just produce that as a witness and you can spend it. Well, uh, Jeremy Rubin just kind of blew my fucking mind um, in the last week, just tossing a random um, idea out on the mailing list that devs have apparently talked about for years where you can do the similar kind of thing where I can delegate the ability to spend my coins to somebody else without having to move them on chain, um, just playing games with SIG hash flags. So let's say I have UTXO A and FUD, you have UTXO B. And I want my UTXO to sit there, not move, not go anywhere, but I want to give you the ability to spend it. So what I would do is I would take both of our UTXOs as inputs in a single transaction, and I would sign my input with sig hash none, so that my signature only commits to those two inputs and none of the outputs. 
Like I have just completely with that transaction, I have given up all control of what the outputs are. You can make them whatever you want, send them wherever you want, including my UTXOA. And all you have to do is just make those outputs, sign your input, and then that's a valid transaction and you can spend my coins. I can delegate that to you with this pre-signed transaction using SigHash None. And like this, like this just blows my mind thinking about like the types of shit you could do with this. And the, the real beauty is I can revoke that control anytime I want by spending UTXOA somewhere else in a different transaction. And you can relinquish that ability by spending your UTXOB anywhere else in a different transaction. But until then, I've delegated control of my coins to you. You can send them wherever you want. And there's no reason why that UTXOB has to just be a single key. Why couldn't it be a multi-sig? Why, why couldn't it be like a three of five with my, my sister, my brother, and a lawyer? Um, you, you know what I mean? That other UTXO, you can make that script whatever the fuck you want. But just by attaching it to mine in this pre-signed transaction, I can delegate my UTXO to whatever the conditions of the other one are. Sounds a lot like signing an otherwise blank check and handing it to me. Yep. But the, the beauty is, though, you can be just you, a group of people, a legal entity, a company that can be anything. And we can do this right now without having to change a single thing in terms of Bitcoin consensus rules. Like it just blew my mind to, to read this and think about this and know that this, this is just something developers have talked about and known for years and just for whatever reason, not really talked publicly or loudly about it. Like e even now it's just amazing that it's, Click, oh, all kinds of new things you can do with Bitcoin. Sounds great to me. Uh, sounds super utilitarian. Well, I mean, just the, the first thing in my head is like, well, inheritance schemes? Do that all day long with all kinds of different setups like this. And I can just pull out and revoke it whenever I want. All right. End of autism. There is never an end to autism. All right, I'm just not going to make the very dark joke that just popped into my head. Um, so what's going on in Nigeria, Janine? Well, another topic we talked about before I disappeared for a month, uh, such as in episode 255, was the rumors that Nigeria was banning Bitcoin. And there had been a 2017 directive that, quote, gave the same banks and financial institutions the leeway to render banking services to cryptocurrency exchanges and traders on the condition that KYC and all policies are applied. But then a new directive basically banned banks and other financial institutions from rendering banking services to persons involved in cryptocurrency trading and entities involved in cryptocurrency exchange at all. And they were basically instructed to close the accounts of anyone who was suspected of doing so. Since then, uh, Nigeria's central bank, uh, specifically the deputy governor, uh, Adamu Lamtek, has said that uh, they are not banning Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies in the country. Um, instead, they are trying to just protect the banking sector from Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, at, I believe it was some kind of conference, he clarified that what we have just done was to prohibit transactions on cryptocurrencies in the banking sector and uh, that there would be stiff penalties imposed if the bank or financial institution failed to comply with the regulation. So essentially, it is okay for you to have Bitcoin or to use Bitcoin, but as soon as you want to, for example, exchange it for fiat, and you want to do that via a bank, then you get in trouble because banks are basically not allowed to touch cryptocurrency. Um, and then according to FX Street, uh, they reported that shortly after shutting down the uh, crypto-related bank accounts, or at least the ones they suspected of being crypto-related accounts uh, in Nigeria, there was a 60% premium on the price of Bitcoin in Nigeria with a peak on February 19th. 
Mm, and what happens when something runs up because it's perceived as illegal? Hmm. Does that promote more interest? It kind of sounds like they're putting handcuffs on their banking system to touch this stuff, which, you know, is their prerogative to do for whatever regulatory reasons. But you're also forcing all that business away from the banks, which is kind of against these FATF type rules coming in that are trying to seed ground to the banks. So I guess we'll see how long that sticks around in Nigeria. I mean, imagine, imagine with, with all the all the upward movement there's been in the price and then you still have a 60 percent premium on top of that yeah Enough to I, make I a guy hungry i i don't see demand for bitcoin in nigeria dissipating because of this at all like <laughs> also i mean it's basically just saying if you want to use bitcoin you have to basically be unbanked i mean i it's kind of not clear like do uh, I mean, I'm assuming it's still okay if you have a bank account and also have Bitcoin, that's fine. It sounds to me like if you just try to use your bank account for anything related to cryptocurrency stuff, then you get in trouble and you'll get your account closed. Yeah, it sounds very similar to what the RBI was doing in India until the Supreme Court stepped in and said they could not prohibit it. Yeah. It's always interesting to... Th the few odd times when courts work properly. Love it. Well, and the great thing about this whole thing is that, you know, for the uh, portion of Nigeria, which is mostly cash based, um, they're going to be buying, they're going to basically have to buy Bitcoin and other things with cash, which means that they're getting a much, they're, they're buying and acquiring Bitcoin in a much more private way than if they had just done it with their bank accounts. Like, yeah, it's sad that banks are being stupid and saying that they would close people's accounts if they did that. But um, at the end of the day, it is a more private way of getting it. Sounds like one of those, you can't ban Bitcoin, Bitcoin can ban you things. Yep. I mean, effectively means the banks can't really surveil their customers' money as much if they don't even, if the customers don't even try to use crypto stuff with their bank accounts, and it, they, they're just going to have a lot less control, and so the effect is actually more privacy because of this. Mm -hmm. So, this one, let's just say. I have no idea, but I find it funny that this came out so quickly um, after Peter dropped the uh, the last episode on nodes. But um, Nadav Ivgi, um, the creator of Bitcoin Wallet Tracker, um, has dropped a project called Easy Node, um, and it's pretty much a one command setup that spins up Bitcoin Core, uh, Bitcoin Wallet Tracker, and Explorer for the Bitcoin RPC, um, Spectre, and then um, can be accessed through Onion, SSH, or SSL. Um, and yeah, um, there is also a optional feature, although warning, warning, blind trust involved um there is a fast sync uh, mode which will just download a pruned um, data directory snapshot from a back-end setup by specter wallet and um yeah just has tor ssh ssl all set up by default um looks very very idiot friendly um and yeah um yeah exactly but <laughs> Yet another Docker Bitcoin stack. Yep. But I do like the fact, though, that this is a very, very basic, simple one that just spools up secure communications, core, specter, and what's needed for them to uh, talk and open up the, the potential to hook up other things to it. And um, yeah, it's, it's not just a, a massive stack of things it's this is what you need to hook your wallet up to your own node that's it 
So for anybody out there making your choice, you've got Umbral and Mino that are definitely competitors in this category. I'm sure there are others. But you should just set it up yourself. You trust less people. For all the command line wizards out there, we challenge you. Alrighty. So this this is a uh, I don't know. This is weird. So um, FTX, um, a derivatives exchange. Um, how, how do I put this? Um, not deeply familiar with this business. Um, not deeply familiar with the ties to things. Um, I know two things. Most of the really experienced traders in this space I know of um, have a very high opinion of the platform itself. Um, they will not stop talking about how the tools they want are there. But there is also another group of people that I uh, don't totally dismiss who have screamed quite a lot about weird um, DeFi scams and pump and dumps and so on, um, you know, related to this so just say that for what it is um but the ceo sam bankman freed um has previously uh, popped up in the scene of politics as one of the biggest biden campaign donators last year and he's popping up again um pretty much a hair's breadth away from closing a deal to um name the miami heats um stadium down in Miami. And pretty much the deal for that um, is some chunk of the money, if this is finalized, is going to go to um, 13 um, county commissioners in local areas in the Miami-Dade County. Um, and it's a lot of the money, I think 20% is going to be put towards um, combating gun violence. Um, with the, the remaining chunk of that being split up to areas based on things like their, uh, shooting homicide, shooting incident counts and such. Um, the number of Florida men. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but yeah. Um, so yeah, um, this is kind of. Really, I would just say this is a stupid thing. Um, if it weren't for the fact that Sam had become so politically active in the last election and where this money is going to go in terms of being used. And yeah, um, really what I take away from this is joy. Um, we're getting into the phase where rich crypto people are just going to start throwing money around to apply their politics everywhere. Sounds like a lot of fun, you know? Yeah. A lot, a lot of rich people just throwing money at enforcing their worldview and politics all over the place. Going to be, going to be great guys. So some details on this, uh, this is 19 years worth of naming rights until 2040. Uh, it's for $135 million. And as far as I know, U.S. citizens, individuals can't trade on FTX. So it's really interesting that they would bother to get them. But then the NBA is considered an international sport, I guess, or has international interest. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how all that works. I mean, I think this is as pure and simple as Sam Bankman Freed is just sitting on a giant pile of money and he's going to go, I'm throwing this to make my politics happen everywhere. And yeah, um, not really fond of, of that as opposed to taking that money and doing things without idiotic government involvement. There is an FTX US division, evidently, but I am not aware of what their product offerings are. Just derivatives on all the things, <laughs> from my understanding, pretty much. It smells toppy, and I don't want it to be toppy yet around here. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess we will see what comes of it. But uh, yeah, no, for the uh, last thing for the show, there is a topic you wanted to touch on a little bit. Yeah, 
I just wanted to clear up, you know, there was a lot of uh, words going around on Twitter that weren't tied anywhere near reality around the state of Bitcoin lending over the last week. And I think most of it was precipitated by BlockFi changing their interest tiers on their product. Um, so BlockFi, as a number of these other lenders have so-called tiers on, on which they pay interest on Bitcoins. And in this case, BlockFi shaved down the size of their uh, highest interest tier to only pay on one coin. And then your second through 20th coins were in tier two and they've created a tier three for all other coins. Uh, so to give some background on this, when BlockFi dropped, uh, they initially did not have a tiered structure. You could put as much Bitcoin in there as you liked and they paid a flat interest rate on all of it. And then at some point they flipped to having a two tiered system where, and then they kept changing how big those tiers were. Initially it might've been 20 coins fell into this first tier and they've shaved that down, shaved that down. It used to be two and a half coins previous to this announcement. And then next month it will go to one coin sits in that first tier. Uh, I thought it was interesting worth commenting on because Leden uh, announced uh, a day or so ago that they are also going to be tiering their interest rate product that uh, previously was not tiered, uh, similar to BlockFi's. I think Leden is doing two coins in that first tier that's going to yield 6.1% interest and then all other coins will get something like two and a quarter interest out of them. Um, other companies in the interest game that have tiers include Celsius Networks, uh, which it yields something like it might be 6.2 on their top tier that also has a two coin limit and then a little over 4% on other coins. Uh, so I just thought it was worth commenting on that. Uh, it was very misunderstood what the tiering was out in public. I think some people took it to mean that depending on how many coins uh, were in such an account in total, uh, you got a different interest rate. So I definitely saw a misconception out there that if, say, you had 20 coins in BlockFi, all 20 of those coins would get the half percent interest rate. I uh, just wanted to clarify that's not exactly how these tiering systems work. Uh, it is interesting to see the lending market mature in Bitcoin terms. Uh, Ledin had some interesting commentary on this in the email that they sent out. Uh, they say the recent changes in the Bitcoin lending market have led to a significant reduction in rates that high quality institutional Bitcoin borrowers are able to pay across the market. There are two main drivers of this dynamic. One, the abundant and growing supply of Bitcoin in search of earning interest. And two, the increased participation of sophisticated investors in the arbitrage of price neutral trades in the Bitcoin market, making these opportunities much more competitive and therefore less profitable. Uh, so in other words, the situation of lending rates coming down has to do with larger, uh, more experienced players coming to the market and having access to the coin they need to close arbitrage gaps, which only makes sense, especially with Sailor out there, you know, playing up to some of these largest uh, companies, et cetera, in the world that would like to see a yield perhaps on uh, money that they hold in their corporate treasuries. So I think everybody knows this market is here now. Uh, it seems like lending rates may trend down due to that. And uh, just worth keeping in mind if you're lending out coin to these guys, exactly what you're getting into. Yeah, so pretty much this is not at all the inevitable implosion of one of these types of businesses. It's just supply and demand stupid. Like people are arbing better and everybody's trying to fucking throw their coins and go give me interest. Yeah, supposedly in a free market, it is supply and demand that sets lending rates. So if you have twice as much coin in there looking for yield this month, it may well be possible those lending rates come down. That said, stable coin lending still off the hook. Yeah, well, you, you have fun with your little interest games. I'm going to keep sitting here with my own keys and have a hundred percent guarantee that I don't get caught in that inevitable one of these things implodes.
Keep it secret. Keep it safe. Alrighty, though. I think that is a wrap for the day. And we are in final thoughts slash meme time. Who's going first? You are. It's a race. Well, uh... Next couple of days, or even maybe by the time you hear this episode, there's going to be another uh, deadline for Assange's uh, extradition hearings, which is that the U.S. government has already filed an appeal, and in a few days, or again, after you might have already seen this episode, uh, by the time you see this episode, um, his defense team is supposed to respond, uh, and we'll find out after that point uh, what happens. I think something about uh, the the court, the high court, will hear and decide on those responses within the next couple of months. Uh, and also there is going to be a very exciting episode happening uh, on a certain podcast in the next couple of days. And you will find out about that through my timeline. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Explain that, or you go back in the Pokeball. I I can't explain it because it's supposed to be a surprise for everyone, and literally no one has mentioned it anywhere. Mm -hmm. Cats out of the Pokeball. Well, I guess uh, you got anything for us, Fud? Just like to say good day to everyone, except those who put half and half in their coffee. Heathens. Well. I don't know. I'm going to shut my mouth in uh, in lieu of not ranting about politics. So on that note, um, hope everyone enjoyed the episode. Catch you later, punks. Take it easy. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, you can have food, sir, yeah. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yeah. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yeah.